Thank you, Jan. Thanks, uh, thanks for the kind introduction and the invite to come here this year. Can you hear me okay? We, no? Okay, how's that? Yeah, we'll work with it. There we go. I can hear that. Uh, well, uh, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about some ID topics over the next few days. So I'm an academic ID doc. Uh, I work at the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics, and um, my area of expertise besides uh, general ID is HIV, so I'm one of the HIV specialists there. And I'm in charge of the quality uh, program for our HIV program, which is a pretty big program, about 800 patients. So some of the things we're going to talk about over the next few days when they come, uh, when it comes to performance measures and that sort of stuff, many of the things you all are beholden to, so am I. And so um, that factors into this talk uh, as well. So we're going to start, talking, start off by talking about uh, uh, adult immunizations. Now, you can play stump the speaker really easy. I'm going to tell you how to do it right now. I'm an internist. I'm not a pediatrician. And so I'm not going to talk about peds vaccines. Uh, so stump the speaker would be easy to do with questions about peds vaccines. So sorry about that. So I'm going to limit my, my uh, comments to uh, adult immunizations today. And I know a lot of you take care of folks with uh, pediatric and adolescents. But you guys knock it out of the park. Uh, on the pediatric side, uh, the success rate is so wonderful in the systems in place compared to those of us in adult medicine. So let's talk a little bit about some of the common things that, uh, that arise. So what do patients and clinicians think about vaccines? We all have our, have our own ideas, our own practice style, and so forth. But I think it's illustrative to take a look and see um, what some of the data and the literature say. So if I were to ask you just to write on your pads what patients have told you or what you think their concerns are, none of this would be a surprise. I think everybody here would come up with a, a very similar list. And this is a survey done a few years ago by the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases about patients' fears and misconceptions around uh, adult immunization. Things like, I had vaccines as a child, I don't need them again. Vaccines aren't necessary for adults. I don't think I can get sick from these illnesses. I've never heard of them or I'm unaware of them. And a couple of things I want to focus on are right here in some of my comments today. Uh, not concerned about spreading illness to others, you see a third, or that vaccine preventable diseases in adults are not serious or life threatening. About a quarter said that. And of course, safety issues. Now, anybody familiar with Pinterest? How many are familiar with, with Pinterest? Okay, good. Sitting in the back of the room, I saw a few computers with Pinterest on ordering things today. No, I, did, I didn't see that. Um, I'm, I'm uh, privy to a wonderful stuffed pol uh, poblano pepper, three cheese stuffed poblano pepper dish with black bean cream sauce and mango salsa that I'm told came from Pinterest. A bathroom remodeling project that's going to start after the first of the year is compliments of Pinterest. Okay? And of course, you know who's telling me this stuff, right? My wife is on Pinterest a lot. Pinterest is a very, very important website. Social media and vaccines. Now, we all probably recognize there's a lot of going on out there. What about the studies that have looked at this? There's been a few. Uh, looking at YouTube videos in one particular study, looking at how many were pro-vaccine versus anti-vaccine. Believe it or not, most of them, when we looked at general vaccines, were actually pro-vaccine. But if you look specifically at YouTube videos around HPV, the HPV vaccine, guess what? Most were negative in their slant. What about MySpace? About 50-50. What about Twitter? Well, one study looked at the tweets put out about immunizations. And actually, most of them were actually pro-vaccine. Pinterest is a very important site. And this study was published this year, actually, looking at how were immunizations portrayed on Pinterest. And it's very interesting. And they looked at 800 vaccine-related pins on Pinterest. And what they did is they looked at them for the nature of what the pin was, uh, direct, was uh, talking about. Was it pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine? And a lot of times on Pinterest, the pin links to something else, an external website. So the punchline here, in terms of how vaccinations are portrayed, pro-vaccine, about 20%. Anti-vaccine, about 74%. Furthermore, when they looked at these pins about 85% of them were linked to an external website off of Pinterest. Only 4% of the web links from this were what we would consider or what were considered sort of from a medical organization, a clinic organization, or a medical structure. In other words, 
Pinterest was taking these people and sending them to places, and our clinics, our medical centers where we work don't have a part of that. And so one of the, one of the issues raised by this study was we ought to tap into that. Like it or not, believe in it or not, whatever, patients are getting a lot of information off social media around vaccines. It's not a surprise. But a site like this really has an opportunity if we were to link some of these pins to, say, the website at UW that talks about influenza vaccines, the patient education site, or what have you. So it's a powerful thing that's out there. And I know we, we tend to hear about it sometimes informally or anecdotally from our patients, but I think you're going to see more studies looking at this. But it's rather sobering when we think about the sheer amount of anti-vaccine uh, messaging going on uh, on the social media. What about physicians? This is a study, a survey done with general internal medicine uh, physicians and also family medicine clinicians looking at U.S. physicians' perspective for adult vaccine delivery published in the annals. There's a lot of factors here, a lot of grading. Let's just take the first half. Let's just cut it in half and look at the top uh, half or so. And what this study showed is a lot of the issues and concerns that clinicians raised around adult immunization were financial based. Now some of this uh, were the things that we hear about and face all the time. I can't afford that vaccine. The shingles vaccine didn't get covered. All these sorts of things. But some of them had to do, for example, with uh, buying vaccines or storing vaccines, the cost and logistics behind that. So financial barriers, again, not a surprise to this group uh, at all, but certainly are high on the list for what do clinicians think about vaccines and vaccine delivery. This is kind of a quirky study. This is a qualitative study. Uh, it, it basically took uh, 20 um, general practitioners in Switzerland, and it asked them some questions about adult immunization. And um, I, I think I show this as much to make us feel a little better, perhaps, uh, about what we do. And uh, just to tee it up a little bit, the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health recommends the Pneumovax for all adults over the age of 64. And in Switzerland, 2%. These are government data. 2% over the age of 64 receive it. That's not a typo. There's a reference in the paper. Hey, that made me feel pretty good when I saw that. You know, We do better than 2%. And that's pretty, that's pretty pathetic, isn't it? And when they did these interviews, what were some of the concerns? What were some of the, the comments? Well, it simply wasn't perceived as a problem in primary care. In their practice, the practitioners said, you know, I haven't seen the epidemiologic data. I really don't know how much pneumococcal disease is out there. I never see patients with proven pneumococcal infection that I know would have been prevented by a vaccine. So these issues came to light, and this quote uh, kind of summarizes that. I just haven't seen pneumococcal disease in my practice. So it's interesting about vaccines. We're using them to prevent something that we hope we never see. The lack of seeing that can sometimes translate into, well, I really don't know how good that vaccine is. And an overriding theme in this qualitative study was I got a lot of other things to do in my practice, so I'm too busy to deal with this particular vaccine. The bottom line in the U.S. is that our rates are low. Again, different than pediatrics who, who do such a terrific job with the systems approach. And let's take a look, and these are the most recent data from 2013. Let's take a look at where we do the best with adult immunization. And as you might imagine, it's the influenza over age 65. 65% shy of the target of 90, but 65% is about the best we do in adult immunization. Take a look at the high risk uh, over 65 pneumococcal, about 60%. But what I really want you to look at are the lines above each of those. Let's go back to the flu. High risk individuals younger than 65, 46%, pretty bad. But look at pneumococcal, 21%, 21%. So our high risk folks, under the age of 65 uh, are really in desperate need to have us try to get these rates up. The others are highly variable. The tetanus toxoid we do pretty good at. Tdap rates are low. Shingles, actually these numbers here for shingles, hep B, and HPV are actually a few percentage points higher than they were the year before. So progress a little bit, overall rates still awful low. These uh, were data published earlier this year in the MMWR. And actually, they're from, uh, from the state I, I live in, Wisconsin. And what they looked at were about 46,000 births uh, in the state of Wisconsin. And they correlated when uh, the, the, the birth took place with 
the maternal receipt of two exceedingly important vaccines that are well studied and recommended uh, to be used during pregnancy, the influenza vaccine and the Tdap. And basically they went back from January of 2013 to March of 14. So right at the time when the recommendation to have a Tdap during the third trimester of pregnancy uh, hit, hit the, uh, hit, hit the uh, airwaves. And what, uh, what we can see here is the darker colored is the Tdap. And you can see that it rose from about 15% to about 50%. So that correlated with the recommendation coming on board. So clinicians were getting on board giving that Tdap during the third trimester. But look what happened subsequent to that. It's plateaued, it's flattened. So we're at about 50%. Tremendously important vaccine should be given in that third trimester not just once, but every pregnancy, right? In order to prevent uh, that neonate, that most susceptible host from getting pertussis, the maternal antibodies. So um, good that it, there was an uptick, but not the kind of success we'd like. So what are some things that can work? Our rates are low, we all know that. We get the feedback from our healthcare systems. What can work? What is the literature shown that can work? Well, we have a big role in this. Recommending them works. This is uh, really, shown to be one of the most important things that can go a tremendously long way to getting folks on board with vaccines. This study is done by Dr. Nickel, who's at the University of Minnesota, who's been terrific in looking at systems approach to adult immunizations, what are the barriers, what are some of the things we can improve upon. And this was published in the, in the mid-1990s. And basically it took a, a group of high-risk patients over the age of 65, chronic cardiovascular conditions, chronic lung disease, high risk for in influenza complications. And importantly, they didn't want a vaccine. So the cohort here were folks that didn't want the vaccine for whatever reason. And recommendation from the provider for influenza and for the Pneumovax, you can see made a, a tremendous difference. Now, you might say, okay, pretty high profile vaccines, old study, what about something newer? This was published a couple of years ago, and it looked at a national immunization survey for adolescent uh, females. You can see the ages here, about 9,000. And really, it asked a pretty simple question. Did you receive a provider recommendation for the HPV vaccine? And it focused on that particular vaccine. And you can see about a little over 50% received a recommendation. So not high, but you know, it is what it is. But look what happened, about a five-fold greater likelihood of getting at least one dose of the HPV vaccine if the provider gave a recommendation. So recommending them works. What about this study? This is kind of interesting, published also a couple years ago. This was a survey sent not to the teens, but to parents, parents of adolescents in a county in Georgia. And it's a county um, that uh, is characterized by really uniquely high rates of vaccinations. For example, the adolescents in this particular study had influenza vaccine rates about 85%, Tdap about 85%. Two thirds had received all three doses of HPV vaccine. Wow, you know, pretty, pretty stunning results. But the point of this table is to look at the association of a recommendation to get a vaccine and what impact did it have. So receipt of vaccine or intent to receive it, hadn't, their, their adolescent hadn't received it yet, but we intend to get it. And basically, you can see the significant values here. The physician recommendation for Tdap, MCV4, HPV, all significant values here. In fact, a physician recommendation was either the number one or number two reason why these parents said, my child uh, has either received a vaccine or I intend to have them get the vaccine. Other important factors were other family members who had a good experience with the vaccine, uh, you know, older siblings, et cetera. But don't underestimate the power of recommending these vaccines to our patients. So when it comes to vaccines, and this is gonna be the hokiest question of the conference, I guarantee. Which vaccines are you good at? I know someone out here is really good at vaccines. Which vaccines are you good at and why? What's that? Pneumonia, Pneumonia. okay. Is this, hello, hello? Pneumonia, pneumonia shot? Here we go. Yeah, and why? Why are you good at it? What makes you good at it? Well, because I, um, I work in an environment where my patients are high risk for a lot of things. They are mainly Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, 
uh, older than 50, that's mainly my patient population, so I am always worried that because of all the other comorbidities, you know, they can get very sick and get pneumonia. Great, so a lot of comorbidities that drive the, the recognition of the risk for, for pneumococcal infection, awesome. What about over here? What, what vaccine is good at? Yes? Uh, Pneumovax. Pneumovax? Okay, I'll just repeat what you say. And why are you good at it? What makes your, wherever you work, good at it? Ah. Oh my, so devastating pneumococcal infection. You're stealing my thunder, by the way. So <laughs> pretend you didn't hear any of that, but great, great uh, comment. How about over here? What vaccines are you good at? HPV or BV? Oh, HPV, yeah. why are you good at it? Oh my God, ecologist. <laughs> ah, so there we go. Uh, you see the great outcomes of that wonderful uh, vaccine. I bet you're good at influenza too, yep. Yep, exactly. Now, it's not all rosy, right? What vaccines are you bad at? Anybody bad at vaccines? Flu shots. There's a prevailing thing in my uh, community that everyone who gets a flu shot gets sick. Isn't that the truth? I, I think I've heard that more this year than the last five years combined, quite frankly. It's been a bad year, in my experience, for people not wanting the flu shot for that exact reason. We also have about a 70% incidence of smoking a lot of smoking, so a lot of at-risk individuals. Yes, sir? Uh, Medicare won't pay for Tdap. So Medicare reimbursement for Tdap is an issue where, where you work, okay? All right. Yes? Uh, issue with the shingles because the, um, we have to send them down to the local drugstore because they're a third the price of our hospital. So. Right. Boy, that's a common story, isn't it? Not just the drugstore, but the Shopco, the grocery store, the wherever they're giving them now, right? I'll tell you what we're, we're bad at. Yeah, you had a comment? Yeah. The Medicare wellness visit helps with uh, queuing in on a lot of vaccinations. Ah, so that actually helps us improve some of that, the preventive the wellness type visits. Good. I tell you what, what we're bad at. We're bad at vaccines where you need more than one dose. You know, and I'm an HIV doc, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but hepatitis B completing the series, we're not any good at that. You know, we're down in the 30% at best, 28%. HPV, I'm sure your clinic knocks it out of the park. We struggle with it mightily. So it's these multi-dose vaccine series, right, that we really struggle with. Well, thanks, thank you everybody for your comments because you bring up a lot of important points and it just goes to show how there's some solutions and there's a lot of commonality too in what we struggle with. Here are some tricks. Again, none of this is rocket science, but it might be some ideas that you might find helpful. Uh, influenza, the machine, happens every fall. Happens every fall. Tag something to it. It's, it's, uh, it's so intuitive, I think, for uh, a lot of us to sort of link the, pneumo the pneumovax or the, or the Prevnar to the influenza. You know, how many times have you asked someone, so have you had that pneumonia shot before? Oh yeah, I get that every year. Every year I get that pneumonia shot. Yeah, well, we're not, we're not talking about the same shot. I'm glad you get something every year. Hopefully it's the influenza. But So pneumococcal, that pneumonia just makes a nice link. Similar hosts, at-risk individuals, tie it. Take advantage of the free PR. I wish every vaccine had the PR that my institution gives the influenza vaccine. Influenza vaccination week was, uh, what, two weeks ago? Last week, I think, right? Tremendous national campaign. It's great. That's wonderful. But why not ride the coattails? Why not pick a vaccine in your clinic, one that you struggle with, and tie it every year to your influenza vaccine campaign? What about shingles? What's the best PR? What's the best advertisement for shingles? CVS? <laughs> Terry Bradshaw. So people that, people that have had it, right. I, you know, I think it's a friend or relative that have had it, right? My sister said, next time I'm in here, I don't care what I'm in here for, I'm going to ask you about that single, singles vaccine, right? Or my neighbor just had it. It tends to drive the whole neighborhood to come to clinic, doesn't it, to get the shingles vaccine. So a friend or relative. Tdap, of course, it's a little one. So um, a lot of individuals may have no desire whatsoever to get that Tdap until we say, well, it's not so much about you. It's about you preventing uh, the transmission to that brand new grandchild you're going to visit over Christmas and New Year's. Or 
the nephew or the niece or what have you, right? So little ones in the family, and that's really where the benefit of Tdap comes in on the adult side is preventing that transmission. So these are really what I call taking advantage of free PR. Now, here's an ARS question for you here. At your side of practice, are you the one who literally, I mean literally, orders the flu shot and your patients get it after they see you? Or you may order the flu shot in theory, but they get it before they see me or some other time. Or I really don't order the flu shot anymore. It happens to spite me, and that's OK. So just to get a sense of the kinds of practice, OK? So a little bit of, little bit of everything here, but some, you know, direct ordering, which, which you know, we've all done. Um, this implies sort of a systems issue, a systems change, maybe for the better. We'll look at that. And, um, and you know, maybe I order it in theory, but they, it happens to spite me, or some other time, I should say, not necessarily after my clinic visit. So you can see there's a widespread. Let's take a look at what some of the studies say about what can help us here. So this is a large meta-analysis that looked at many, many studies, both immunization and cancer prevention. And, with the immunization studies and the cancer prevention studies, both came to the same conclusion, different studies. But when they looked at what was the most powerful factor at driving adult immunization, you can see the odds ratio here, it was organizational change. It was a system that supports the kinds of systems needed to promote adult immunization. And they, there's a smattering of those in the studies, you might imagine, standing orders we're going to talk about, reminders, you can see here financial incentives are here, right? But or, an organization that is on board with trying to get the right systems in place. And that's where I, I, I reflect on what happens like where I work for the uh, flu shots every year. You know, I get asked, you know, hey, when are those flu shots coming? You're an ID doc, you should know. I say, you know what, I know when they show up. I know when the stack of vaccine information statements this tall shows up and my nurses are just given flu shots like there's no tomorrow, and that's great. I'm out of the loop, and that's perfectly fine with me. I'm there for questions or concerns, but other than that, it's on autopilot. And again, dovetailing other vaccines onto that would be wonderful. What about standing orders? Well, Dr. Nickel, once again, in a study published in the 1990s, took a look at influenza vaccination rates. And this particular study is more than just standing orders. It really emphasizes you need a multi-pronged approach. Again, not terribly surprising. But baseline rates, pretty pathetic. After doing what we're, here, we're doing here right now, better, but not where they ought to be. Standing orders took the rates up to nearly 80%, multifaceted, including reminders, education, standing orders, and you can, see, you can see this sustained improvement over a 10 year period. So that's pretty neat. I think this is a, a wonderful study. This is a, a lipid clinic run by pharmacists in Houston, Texas. Now, it's a secondary prevention clinic where folks who have uh, atherosclerotic disease are seen for lipid management, half an hour appointments. They took it on themselves to try to improve uh, influenza vaccine rates. And uh, they integrated this into their lipid clinic. Directed by pharmacists, they did the education, they did the ordering, they did the administration. Published in 2007, so you know, eight years later, we're seeing a lot of these models pop up like CVS has mentioned and so forth. But this is a discrete clinic. But here's what I want to point out. Their overall rates went up about 40% to 76%. That's great. But it's this other slide here, this other figure, and what this is indicating, the gray bars are under 65 and the dark bars are over 65. Remember that 2013 data, how poorly we do in the under 65 groups at risk, look, we were able to match our success with the over 65. In other words, they were able to get everybody up, not just you know, a certain age group, which is pretty neat. This was so successful, they moved on to pneumococcal vaccination and others uh, with this model. This study, though, looked at how many clinics have standing orders for vaccines. It was a survey about 900 family medicine and general internists looking at standing order programs, do you have one for influenza vaccines and pneumococcal vaccinations? And you can see more than half of the practices did not. Some had both, some had flu, and nobody had pneumococcal vaccination alone. The factors associated with having both an influenza and a pneumococcal standing order program 
openness to change, perceived practice openness to change. Again, that's the systems change. The organization has to buy into it. Strong teamwork, an EMR, someone who's a champion for these to do it, and access to a, a clinic staff who also is part and parcel with the, with the uh, program. So real quick story about my clinic. I direct the quality efforts for our HIV program. We have about 800 plus patients, pretty good sized program. Our rates were much lower than we wanted them to be. Across a whole variety of vaccines, we just didn't want to pick on one. We wanted, we wanted to get a lot. So we sat down, we met administrators, pharmacists, social workers, nursing staff, myself, other clinicians. Uh, man, we had a room full of people that we, we worked with. So we met and we discovered. What did we discover? We discovered that our healthcare system, UW Health, had a standing order protocol approved three years before our meeting. And we had no idea it existed. In fact, what happened was our administrators said, hey, I think I, think I heard, I think I heard that the pediatric ID group and some others, they had put together this standing order protocol. Sure enough, protocol 56 basically said any adult or pediatric patient seen at a clinic who's due for immunization is covered in this protocol. And we didn't know it existed. I'm sure many of your healthcare systems are as big or bigger than mine, but we all know a lot of stuff is in these systems. And it's just in a rather embarrassing example that we didn't know our own system had done something like this. So check it out. You might, there might be some avenues already worth exploring that are in place, but done in other parts of your, of your system. So what works? The personal side, why we all went into medicine, probably, talking to patients, recommending them. Don't undersell or undervalue that. It's very, very important. Older data and contemporary data support that. All ages, right? That first study was over 65, didn't want a flu shot. The HPV, right? So a wide spectrum. Take advantage of free PR, piggyback onto the flu, because the flu's gonna happen every year, no matter what we do. Standing orders is a great evidence-based approach to helping adult immunization. And just pick one to work on. Have your clinic and clinic staff say, you know what, I wanna improve, improve Tdap rates. I wanna improve our shingles rates. Whatever you wanna pick, pick one and work on for the new year. All right, so enough of that stuff. Let's talk about some specifics. So um, the adult schedules here, you know, this is uh, gonna be um, out of date, already is. Um, the new schedules come out in February, but we're all familiar with this, uh, whether it, it has the lineup of the vaccines over here, the ages up top, or in this case, I picked the one that has the comorbid conditions, which I, I like actually, I think this is pretty neat. I like it because you can highlight pregnancy and quickly see <clears throat> the vaccines that everybody ought to get in the yellow, the ones that are contraindicated, the one there's no data for, and then the ones that if someone has a unique risk, they ought to get in purple. When we look at HIV, just as another example, I like how this chart doesn't pigeonhole all the immune compromised hosts into one category. It divides them up a little bit into greater and lower risk. So for example, on the HIV side, under 200 CD4 cells and over 200 CD4 cells. So you can go down the, the line here and see uh, a lot of important comorbid conditions. Now, the ACIP meets in October of every year to finalize the recommendations that will be coming out the subsequent February, okay? But they have meetings in, in June, they have meetings in February, they have meetings in October. They were really busy this year after, you know, since the February 2015 schedules came out. Believe it or not, these are all the updates starting here in March and as recently as mid-October in terms of some updated and provisional and so forth guidance that came out in between schedules. So a lot of work got done. We kind of had a reprieve last year, but this year they didn't give it to us. There's a lot of updates. I've, um, uh, Kathy was kind enough to uh, make sure on the website that you're getting our slides from. There's two resources that I, I put there. One is a very, very hard to find guidance for HPV-9. It's a CDC guidance. Uh, if you Google it, it tends not to come up very readily. You kind of have to dig for it. And so it's a quick and dirty, very practical, what do I do with this HPV-9 if they've already received three doses of the HPV-4, et cetera? Um, a lot of good practical questions. So she's included that uh, with, with your resources. I'm not gonna talk very much about that unless there's, there's questions. The, the punchline for the HPV-9 uh, is in 2016, it will be one of the choices on the adult side for both men and women. 
um, the additional five serotypes add about 15% additional coverage for the HPV strains that cause cancer. So remember the 16 and 18, which all three of the vaccines have, the two, the four, and the nine, account for about two-thirds of cervical cancer strains. This, this adds about another 15% on top of that. And it also covers about an extra four or 5% of some of the male HPV-associated uh, cancers. So um, this is out. Typhoid uh, vaccine, we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. Uh, meningococcus, we're gonna talk about today. Yellow fever, update. Uh, influenza, of course, is every year. We're gonna talk about pneumococcal and another meningococcal. The other resource I, I provided to you is a very recent version of an outstanding vaccine resource that I personally get, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, further in the talk here. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue from Immunization Action Coalition that just came out devoted solely to the meningococcal vaccinations, and it really talks a lot about meningococcal B uh, vaccines. So in, in February, we're gonna have the new schedules, but we already know what they're gonna say. And on the adult side, they're gonna update the HPV-9. They're gonna talk about a pneumococcal vaccine interval that's always been confusing, that they're trying to make less confusing, and meningococcal B are, are the biggies that will come out. So what vaccine generates the greatest number of questions? Which one do you think? HPV, a lot of questions, I would agree. Oh boy, Pneumovax versus Prevdar, we're gonna get into that, that's great. Well, in our world, it's a lot of this, and I've heard a couple already. So let's start you off with a case. This is a woman who comes to see you for a pre-op H&P, and she has colon cancer, so she's gonna to go to surgery, and you know she's gonna get chemotherapy. It's that classic story, her sister had shingles, that said no matter what you're doing, when you go to see your doc in clinic, ask about that shingles vaccine, okay? So she's in doing the pre-op. What should you do about the shingles vaccine today? Don't give it because she has active cancer. Don't give it because she has chemotherapy coming around the corner. It's okay to give it, or it's okay to give it, but wait till the chemo is over. Go ahead and vote. All right, look at that, 78. 80, oh, we've got some others coming in, don't give. All right, good. So most of you are comfortable in giving that vaccine today, right? Let's talk about it. So as you know, there's a discrepancy between the FDA labeling and the ACIP recommendations. So the vaccine, is, this live attenuated vaccine is licensed FDA for adults over 50, but the ACIP has stood very firm at their recommendation of 60 or older. I bet every one of you has gotten the question from someone younger than 60, should I get the shingles vaccine? I just had a 37-year-old ask me that on Wednesday, a gentleman with HIV who's already had shingles, wondering if he should get it to prevent another bout. So we all experienced that. The original trials, it cut the risk of getting zoster by about half. It also had a very meaningful input on preventing postherpetic neuralgia. So it works uh, in, in this fashion. We all know the uptake has been low and for pretty well-known reasons, right? Financial, we've heard that already. When it first came out, Merck shifted the vaccine production toward the varicella. It uses the same strain. And the, uh, the allotments of the zoster vaccine were, were actually very low. That's all long since resolved. So uh, we don't have the production issues anymore. But mostly it has to do with the financial, the, the fact that Part D doesn't reimburse and so forth or cover it. Now, here's a study I wanted to share with you published last year that looked at the importance of individuals over 60 who get chemotherapy and their risk of zoster and what the zoster vaccine might be able to do for them. So one thing about it is the zoster, zoster risk is four times greater if you're getting chemo and you're older than 60 than if you're healthy and over than 60. So it's a significantly increased risk. And in this particular Kaiser study, those who got the vaccine before chemo had a 42% reduction in their zoster compared to those who did not get the vaccination. So that's a nice reduction and a nice thing to keep in mind when we're seeing folks preoperatively who anticipate getting immune suppression. So a lot of the common questions we get about zoster have to do with someone who's already immune suppressed. 
Can, is it safe to give? Should we give it? Can we give it? And the one resource I would point you to for that is the original MMWR that came out when the vaccine was licensed. There is a wonderful less than half a page, very, you'd be surprised at the level of detail discussion of azathioprine dosing, um, or captopurine, steroid dosing, et cetera, pretty specific about who is okay to get the vaccine and who isn't. Now you might say, well, what, what data do we have to really support that? Not much. I think a lot of it was probably based uh, you know, on the limitations of the studies and who was allowed to get in the studies initially. But you'd also be surprised at how much latitude there is with a lot of commonly used uh, you know, temporary immune suppressing agents like injected corticosteroids and so forth. The other nice thing about that particular initial MNWR is they do have a nice recommendation. You want to give it at least two weeks, and some would say a month, before launching into anticipated immune suppression. That might be chemo, it might be TNF, whatever it is. Be proactive about giving that vaccine before upcoming immune suppression. Here's a resource I wanted to share with you. This is a 2013 Infectious Disease Society of America immunization or vaccination of the immune compromised host. And they also have a very similar recommendation. Should immune compromised patients or those who will undergo immune suppression receive the vaccine? And they say yes, certainly over 60, give it a month ahead of time. And they even say give it, you know, folks 50 to 59. So a nice recommendation there. If you're not familiar with this, I just wanted to share with you the table of contents because I, I guarantee it'll be helpful along the way in addressing some of the questions that come up. What about household contacts of immune compromised hosts? Which vaccines can we give? International travel, specific vaccines, and then a lot of detailed information about you know, certain immune compromised individuals. It's a great resource. It's one of the three that I want to share with you today. This is an interesting series of studies, and what this really gets to is the sequence of studies done from the original cohort of individuals who were in the very first Zoster vaccine trial for the current vaccine. And it followed them out over a second study and then a third study that was published this year. And what it looked at was how did the endpoints change by the post-vaccination year from these people who got the vaccine originally? So in other words, how long did the vaccine last? Now, true with all vaccines, they're gonna wane over time, they're gonna have some time point where they're not as effective. And what was found in this particular study out to year 11 is that for preventing zoster, so preventing the actual incidence of herpes zoster of shingles, uh, about year eight is when a statistically significant change occurred where the vaccine lost its effectiveness, okay? About year eight. So that's what it gets you. And John Tempty, who's a family medicine doc at our, at our at University of Wisconsin, who just stepped down as the ACIP chair, so he was a, is a great resource for immunizations, he had a quote in a practice update that uh, addressed this or, or sort of was talking about this study. And he says in his practice, he doesn't give it to folks under the age of 60. And he says the early 60s, age of 60, represents a sweet spot where better immunogenicity and duration of protection because of their younger age intersects with a greater risk uh, of zoster with ages over 60 as opposed to under 60. So that's a viewpoint. But the editorial for this article by Rich Whitley at UAB, a uh, terrific uh, researcher, clinician uh, uh, in, in the world of virology, kind of took a different slant. And he said, you know, this might require rethinking of the recommendations. We might need to give it a second time, specifically eight years after the first dose. Now, it's hard enough given the first dose, right? I know what you're thinking, giving a booster. There's no formal recommendations for that. But it does put that into context. Has anybody heard the news this week about shingles? Do a, do a Google on shingles, hit news, and you'll be surprised at what shows up. This week, two articles were published online, uh, one in PLOS Medicine, the other in the Mayo Clinic Review, about the risk of stroke and myocardial infarction on the heels of having an episode of zoster. In the PLS study, the risk of stroke twofold higher and the risk of MI almost twofold higher after getting a, a bout of shingles. In the Mayo Clinic study, the risk of stroke was higher. And that risk of stroke was most important after getting shingles and it fades, it, it kind of loses steam after about six months. 
And there's theories abound as to why. Maybe it's the, uh, the high blood pressure and the terrible pain that comes with shingles. Maybe it's reactivation of the virus traveling down the cervical nerves and getting into the intracerebral arteries actually and replicating and causing inflammation. But both of these studies are out and they are gonna fuel a lot of questions that we're gonna get about the utility of this vaccine. Now, this is another part of the vaccine story for our current vaccine. And it looks at the original trial, the overall efficacy about half, it drops zoster by about half. But look at what we do when we start getting higher up in age. The efficacy really drops. The older you are when you get it, the less effective it's going to be. 64, 41, 18% in those over 80. So what's really neat is a study published in May looking at a new zoster vaccine that uh, is an adjuvanted herpes zoster subunit vaccine, glycoprotein E, with a very potent adjuvant. And the punchline on this vaccine is that the rates, irrespective of age, the rates of protection against getting zoster were the same. In other words, even though you marched up in years, the rates of getting shingles uh, were equivalent. It was protective even in the older group. So in this particular figure here, placebo, these are the rates of shingles up here very high, uh, uh, relatively high, I should say, compared to not getting shingles or the low rates in the vaccine group in the lighter color. That's pretty neat. So this is uh, safety data ongoing, additional studies are going. There's actually a study comparing this vaccine to the current live attenuated vaccine ongoing as well. Greater immunogenicity, more injection site reactions, more moderate reactions, not any severe reactions any more than what we're used to seeing, but stay tuned to, for safety issues, okay? So you all uh, really did a great job. That individual should receive that zoster vaccine before chemotherapy. All right, another case. 44-year-old gentleman had a spleen out three years ago. I think he received a pneumovax at that time. Should he receive that new pneumococcal vaccine? Yes, nope. Yes, but you gotta wait five years from the pneumovax. Or not sure, but these pneumococcal vaccines in adults sure are confusing. A hundred percent, Kathy. Have you ever seen a hundred percent in one of these? Oh, uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Say the buttons must be stuck or something. That's great. All right, let's talk about them. Um, two topics I want to hit today. I really thought for the first time in a long time I could ditch pneumococcal uh, immunizations from this kind of talk, but with that September update, I felt like I ought to keep them in. Uh, and I want to go over two things. What they said in September, which is actually pretty mild, pretty minimal. And then what I think, uh, at least by the questions we get, is probably the most confusing element of adult pneumococcal immunizations is the, the, the pneumovax boosters, the pneumovax booster story. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Now, who needs both the Prevnar and the Pneumovax? I think your comment back there was along those lines. Who needs both of the vaccines? Who needs both of the vaccines is everybody over the age 65. So that was integrated into our practice in late 2014, so essentially all of this year, if you will. Everybody over the age of 65. The very first recommendation for the Prevnar in adults was actually in 2012, and it was in four high-risk groups of individuals younger than 65. Immunocompromised, asplenic, cochlear implants, and those with spinal fluid leaks. Okay, so that recommendation has been around for a while. I, cop I copied this table right out of the CDC because I think it, it always makes me think when I, when I see it, quite frankly. And, you know, how you define immune compromise, you know, is, is a moving target. This is how they define it for these purposes. Congenital or acquired immune deficiencies, okay. HIV, I buy it. Chronic renal failure, nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome, lose a lot of antibodies, a lot of protein, right? They're at risk for invasive pneumococcal disease. Leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's, that makes sense. My favorite term in all of adult immunization, generalized malignancy. I've yet to find what that means. So I define it myself when I think about it. Iatrogenic immune suppression, transplant, and myeloma. A lot of high-risk hosts, okay? Some of these might be a little surprising. I just want to point out the chronic kidney disease, nephrotic syndrome in particular, uh, pay, pay close attention to that. The uh, CAPITA study is what the CDC, ACIP were waiting for. Huge trial, Netherlands, looking at the Prevnar in adults over 65. Big study, 85,000 adults, 
they used a serotype-specific urinary antigen to see did the vaccine serotypes protect against getting certain kinds of pneumonia and bacteremic complications. The punchline for the different endpoints of getting pneumonia at all, getting non-bacteremic pneumonia, or the worst of all, IPD stands for invasive pneumococcal disease. This means pneumococcal infection at a sterile site, meningitis, bacteremia, or pneumonia with bacteremia. You can see the reduction in these in these issues quite a bit. So the vaccine showed uh, uh, a lot of promise in this study, and that's what ushered in the recommendation to give it to everybody age 65 and older. Now, what did they modify here in September? Well, let's take it the easy one first. If you have someone who warrants both vaccines and they've never had a vaccine for pneumococcus before, always start with the Prevnar. The Prevnar comes first, okay? That's easy, and that's what they told us to do from the start. What about, though, if they've, you've given that Prevnar, when can we give the Pneumovax? This is a little tricky because it's a big deal if you give them too close to one another. The immunogenicity of these vaccines is highly dependent on being separate. They will blunt each other's response, and that's been clearly shown in the studies that have been done. Now, <clears throat> the interval at which you can give that Pneumovax after your Prevnar depends on who you're giving it to. If it's that high-risk group, immune compromised, asplenic, cochlear implants, spinal fluid leak, you wait at least eight weeks and then you give it, okay? Age over 65, immune competent, so you're healthy, over age 65, I'm doing this because the guidelines say to do it, no other unique risk, you wait at least a year to give the Pneumovax after giving that, and that's the change. When the recommendations first came out, they were really terrible. It had a six to 12 months and do this and it, it really was confusing. They just said, you know what, let's make it a year, and I'll show you why in just a minute. What about if you gave the Pneumovax first or they received the Pneumovax first? When can you give the Prevnar? And this is no change. You want to wait at least a year. And this is for immunogenicity, okay? So focus on the year for a lot of people, except your very high-risk folks. You want to shorten that. Why? We want to get the protection on board, even if it might pay a little bit of a price in terms of immunogenicity. Now, why, what, do they, what did they do here in September? They said they were simplifying things for us. Harmonization across adult, adolescent, and pediatric uh, groups, and basically CMS regulations that said Medicare will cover different pneumococcal vaccines, so the Prevnar and the Pneumovax are considered different if they're given at least a year apart, okay? So that drove the change. What about boosters for Pneumovax? So let's shift gears completely. Ditch the Prevnar here for a few minutes. What about Pneumovax boosters? There's been no recent changes, but I find this to be a confusing topic. So let's break it down into three categories. First category, if someone gets a Pneumovax at age 65 or older, they don't need any more. No further doses are needed if they get it at age 65 or older. Even if they're 90, even if they're 95, they, ACIP says don't give them any more. That's nothing new. What if you got one or two doses before age 65, and now you turn 65? In 2013, it was the first time the ACIP said, do a catch-up dose. So in theory, some people could get two or three Pneumovax doses throughout their adult life. Here's an example. Someone has heart failure, and you diagnose it, they're 52, you give them a Pneumovax because it's chronic cardiovascular condition, great. At least five years have gone by. They want you to wait at least five years. And lo and behold, they turn 65. You give them that booster at age 65. Okay, makes sense? What else would you do at age 65? You'd also give them, oh, well, but, yep, but in terms of the pneumococcal, they'd also be a candidate for the Prevnar, right? So, right, because they turned 65. Not because of their heart failure, but because they turned 65. So you'd have to be concerned about the timing, wouldn't you, when they turn 65, okay? Someone gets, di uh, you know, diabetes at age, age 64, you want to wait at least five years and then give that booster. Diabetes at age 35, you give them your Pneumovax at 35, you give them one at 65, okay? This is the one that's tricky. Some groups need a one-time five-year booster immediately after you give the baseline. And these are the highest risk groups, the highest risk groups for invasive pneumococcal disease. Guess what? They're the same groups we just looked at for the 
uh, for what we looked at for the Prevnar, believe it or not, chronic renal failure, nephrotic syndrome, losing antibodies, immune compromised host, asplenic. Pay attention here. Here's an example. HIV gets diagnosed age 22. Renal transplant age 22, doesn't matter. Five years after that, you give a boost, so age 27. Living a long life, as we'll talk about later this morning, age 65, you give the third, okay? That's a good example there. This chart is cumbersome, but what it does is it actually summarizes both of these groups, the PCV and the five-year revaccination, and you'll see that they're mirror images. They're mirror images of one another. Now, back to our case. A 44-year-old gentleman had a spleen out three years ago, and he got his Pneumovax. Is he a candidate for the PCV13? Oh, I love it. Yeah, I'm going to click right now, 100%. <laughs> he got his uh, spleen out. He received a PCV. Is he a candidate for PCV again when he turns 65 every five years in two more years at age 46 or in two more years age 46 and at 65? Look at, the, look at all the options. Okay. Come on. Come on, D. Come on. Come on. Right? So he got a spleen out, high risk host, three years ago. He was 41. So he needs, he's in that group, that very high risk for invasive pneumococcal disease. He gets a five year booster. So he needs that boost at age 46. He's going to live a long life. He gets it when he turns 65. Okay? If that doesn't, if that doesn't quite click, we can talk about that at QA. Okay? Now, which group does ACIP recommend boosting every five years with the Pneumovax? COPD? Asplenic, lung transplant, complement deficiency, or nobody? I would say one of the most common questions, one of the most common scenarios, usually driven by subspecialists, are patients getting a pneumovax every five years. I'm just going to click right there. They've actually never had a formal recommendation for that, even though it's done all the time. Okay? There's never been a formal recommendation. So I'll skip over this for the sake of time. It just summarizes, and in your slides, it summarizes what this gentleman who's asplenic should get. Now, I'm going to wrap up after this, this quick uh, couple slides here. Can I see a show of hands, please? Can everybody raise their hand? Please over here, raise your right hand. Everybody, over here, everybody. Everybody, please raise your right hand. Excellent. Put your hands down. There was no purpose of having you do that. I just wanted to see if you'd do it. You did. You're a great group. Actually, I tricked you. You just volunteered for something. You volunteered for something. I pulled a terrible trick on you. I shouldn't do this as a speaker, a wonderful audience, but I just did. Quick war story. ID consults, University Hospital, get called to see a guy by the ophthalmologist. He has endophthalmitis. He's already lost sight in this eye. He's rapidly losing it in this one. And they tap his eye, and they say he's got bacterial endophthalmitis. Blood cultures, positive for pneumococcus. I go to meet the guy, echocardiogram, mitral valve endocarditis. So he, it all tied together. We've all seen patients like this. The nicest guy, even nicer than Jan. If it's possible, this guy is nicer than Jan. Yes. This guy was the nicest guy I've ever met. He couldn't see when I walked in the room. He literally tried to get up out of the bed to shake my hand before I could even introduce myself. Just your heart just went out to him. And he had this devastating, devastating infection. I got to know him because I had to treat his endocarditis for six weeks, right? Good news is sight fully back here, mostly back here, endocarditis just fine, no other emboli. We talked about in the hospital why he got this, and in clinic, he asked me again. He said, Dr. Urban, why did I get this? And I said, oh, yeah, remember back in the late 90s, you had your spleen taken out for that platelet thing, and uh, folks who don't have their spleen are at high risk for this. He said, nobody told me that. Nobody told me that. I said, wow. It was a hospital across town. I actually got the records. They talked about giving pre-op pre -op vaccines. Okay? I couldn't find evidence that they did, but I think they probably did. And then in all the progress notes since then, no mention, zero mention of the risk or concern or our update. And this is the kind of guy who actually would have gotten a Pneumovax every week if you would have had. He would have done anything, right? And I'm not at all saying or implying that the vaccine would have magically prevented this, but it sure would have been our best way to do it, right? So your mission that you volunteered for, thank you for doing that, is to not miss missed opportunities, which this study showed, invasive pneumococcal disease, whether you're hospitalized, ER, or coming to primary care to go over this important vaccine for high-risk hosts. 
So get a list of all your asplenic hosts and review them. These are terribly at high risk patients. They're pneumococcal vaccines. I bet they need a pneumovax booster and maybe they need their Prevnar too. They're meningococcal. Believe it or not, they need a every five year booster of the MCV4. And now they need the meningococcal B, the new kid on the block. The Hib, they need a one time dose. They need annual flu shots. Talk to them about the devastating condition of postpolonectomy sepsis syndrome and talk to your urgent care and ER people. How do you manage people when they come in who are asplenic with a fever? Don't send them out without blood cultures, a thorough assessment, a follow-up plan. They will get sick on you within 24 hours and die of overwhelming pneumococcal sepsis. When the spleen is out, a lot of bad things can happen, okay? Um, perfect. So three resources I use, the website for the CDC. This is fantastic. And this is the, uh, the resource I have uh, that Kathy put in that has to do with the meningococcal vaccinations. It's a wonderful website that has an ask the expert section, which every practical question you've ever wondered about vaccines is there. And I encourage you to use it. I use it all the time. And this is what I shared with you. We can go over meningococcus uh, during a Q&A and, and such, but I better wrap it up. Thank you. You want to do questions now or later? We can take uh, just a couple of questions. Yes. Right, so what do we do about the age discrepancy in the shingles vaccine? The, the ACIP recommendation is 60 or older. The labeling in the package insert is 50 and older, and that's always been a disconnect. Um, and so it gets to the heart of some of the studies I presented, and I think you wanna talk to your patients about, for example, that, that data I shared. It's gonna last about eight years or so in protection. So if they get it, like the 37-year-old gentleman who saw me on Wednesday, his protection is gonna run out pretty quick actually, and then there's no recommendation to give a second dose, so what do I do as, as a clinician? So a lot of unanswered questions. So you wanna focus on the duration of the vaccine, and you wanna focus on their age risk. So someone in their 50s clearly is starting to get into the risk for getting shingles, but not as high as 60s, not as high as 70s, right? So that's where Dr. Tempty is sort of focusing on this early 60s being the sweet spot of, of uh, trying to prevent shingles because you're gonna get pretty good immunogenicity. Remember that one slide showed terrible immune response if you're 70 or older or 80 or older compared to 60. And you're now entering a significant risk of getting shingles. So I think you wanna have the discussion with them about, about these, these things. Well, you might, you know, if you get it now, uh, it may not be if, around to protect you when you turn 65 and 70 and 75 when your risk is gonna be higher. And we don't have a recommendation now to do a booster. I think the new vaccine, if it makes it to market, if the subunit, if it gets approved, will go a long way to helping us with this, this issue. Affordability, you mentioned the Affordable Care Act uh, covers it um, if you're uh, not, a, you know, if you're in an ACA insurance program during the preventive uh, annual visits, so they actually cover it in that capacity, but we all know the Medicare struggles with that, so out of pocket is certainly relevant. Real quick to address your post zoster. Um, there is a recurrence rate of zoster, um, anywhere from one to five and a half percent, depending on the study you look at. So people can get it again, and it is useful in preventing uh, a recurrence. Um, you want to wait probably about six months after that acute episode uh, is the latest guidance, because the natural immunity that occurs from getting shingles will actually blunt the vaccine effect. So you want to wait about six months after your shingles episode is over if that patient wants to get the shingles vaccine. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. Uh, more of a comment about frustration with regard to the Nimavax, Prevnar, and the flu. Uh, our hospital asks every patient, every admission that they have pneumonia. And there's very, very high number of patients who are up to date. But I find a lot of unnecessary duplication of vaccinations for patients, for example, when they have their last vaccination. Number one. Number two, the hospital doesn't, doesn't notify. 
Yeah, I, comments about redundancy, about uh, the systems not talking, we, we experienced that. Many states have an immunization registry, um, and you can look at it, but you have to realize for adult immunizations, that's passive reporting for adolescent and adults, so you don't have to report to that. So we experience a lot of uh, them getting, our patients getting it somewhere else, and that somewhere else doesn't report to the Wisconsin immunization registry that we rely on. We can get to it through Epic, but it's only as good as what we're able to look at. And uh, we don't always get the facts from a drugstore or wherever that they, we used to get more of them actually, that, oh, Mr. Smith got his influenza vaccine at this drugstore. And then we're the ones that reported that. So there's no mandate to report adult immunizations. So virtually uh, all of our systems are gonna have a failure rate in terms of not tracking adequately what people have gotten. So your, your points are well taken. I think we should. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Andy.